Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the OVM quarterly outreach session. My name is Susan Alpohl. Before we begin, just going through some of the webinar logistics, today's presentation is being recorded, and I will email a link to the recording as well as a copy of the presentation to everyone tomorrow. We do ask that you keep your webcams off and audio on mute. Uh, once the Q&A begins, you can enable your webcams and audio. Um, during the presentation, we do ask that you submit your questions using the chat feature, and we will not acknowledge the hand raising until the Q&A session begins. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Vincent Nicosi. Great, thanks Susan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so before we hop into today's content, we'd like to first gauge your interest on returning to an in-person OVM quarterly. Uh, we've been performing this style of quarterly for, for roughly about two years now. Uh, we'd like to know how you, the attendees, would prefer to receive future content. So momentarily, you'll see a, a poll appear on your screen. Um, we just appreciate some of your feedback in regards to how you'd like to receive this content going forward. So we'll probably run this for maybe about 30 seconds to a minute. And, uh, Susan, whenever it gets to a point that you think it is uh, satisfactory, we can, we can end the poll. We're at 60%, so give it another 65. All right, we're at 75%, so I'll end that. Awesome. Okay. So thank you for sharing that information. This will be helpful as we as we go forward in deciding how we're going to, uh, to, to share this content with you as we move into uh, Q3. So Susan, if you wouldn't mind uh, progressing to the next slide. So without further delay, I'd like to again welcome you to the Q2 OVM outreach meeting. Uh, my name is Vincent McCosey. I'm the Director of Fleet Policy and Administration here at the Office of Vehicle Management. So I'll kick things off by reviewing today's agenda, introducing our presenters, and providing some useful information. Um, in synopsis of today's agenda, uh, Stephen Powers will share some information regarding catalytic converter thefts and how to minimize your agency's risk for falling victim. Dave Sargent will provide some information on, excuse me, uh, do, 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 we, how did I lose that? I lost the screen. There we go. Uh, so Dave Sargent will provide VH117 statewide contract update, updates. Karen Rasnick will then talk to the ongoing vehicle ordering issues and the innovative way that OVM plans to help agencies through these challenges. Um, I won't steal our thunder, but the, the new program involves stocking an inventory of available lease vehicles, which could reduce the current wait time for specific vehicles, specifically EVs, by up to 90%. So more to come on that later in the presentation. Next up, we'll have Eric Friedman of DWR, who will present the total loss of ownership or total cost of ownership of EVs and how you could save your fleet thousands and also share some helpful information on funding of charging stations and equipment installations. But lastly, um, we'll bring it over to uh, Haiti Janik of DEP, who will share some great information on available grants through her agency. And finally, we'll wrap the presentation as we always do with some Q&A from attendees. So uh, this slide uh, was included as a takeaway for audience members. Uh, it includes the names and contact information for the entire OVM team. Uh, all of which would be happy to help you if, if you have any sleep related questions or concerns. Excuse me, I'm moving a little too fast. Uh, now, the following slide uh, is an introduction of the Green Fleet Committee. This slide notes the Green Fleet Committee members, all of whom have played an important role in the messaging of today's presentation and leading the way to a greener, more sustainable fleet. I'd like to give just a small shout out to Chelsea Keene, who was unable to be with us today. She was a, a huge, um, she was a huge uh, help as it came to building this presentation out and will be sadly missed as a Green Fleet Committee member. So big thanks to everybody who's participated. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, this slide notes uh, the pertinent statewide contracts and their co corresponding contract managers. I'd like to just remind all interested attendees that contract user guides can be found in both Comguys or in mass.gov. 
Uh, and these are great resources and I'd encourage all of you using those contracts to review them. And with all of those housekeeping items out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to the first presenter, Stephen Powers. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Powers. I'm the business analyst for vehicle maintenance and repair. And today I'll be talking to you about thefts from vehicles. Uh, and specifically, I will be addressing catalytic converter thefts, tips to prevent them and what to do if it happens to your state vehicle. So a catalytic converter is essentially a filter bolted to the underside of a gas powered or hybrid vehicle. It's part of the vehicle's exhaust system that reduces harmful emissions. It uses a chamber to change the harmful compounds from a, an engine's emission into safe gases before they are released into the environment. Uh, the catalytic converter is located on the underside of the vehicle and looks like a large metal box. There are two pipes coming out of it that are attached to the engine in the tailpipe. Thieves target catalytic converters because they contain precious metals like gold, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. And the theft requires very little tools and can be completed very quickly. And thieves have been stealing catalytic converters at increasing rates as the value of these precious metals have increased significantly with current supply uh, chain issues. And from 2019 to 2020, reported thefts of catalytic converters rose 326% nationwide, according to the National Insurance Crime Bureau. And these thefts can cost anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 to repair. And with the high demand for these parts, they have become uh, more difficult to source in recent years. Next slide, please. So how will you know if your catalytic converter has been stolen by thieves? Um, with the catalytic converter missing, uh, the uh, exhaust dumps into the open air well ahead of the muffler and the resonators, which makes your exhaust system extremely loud. You'll also likely notice uh, the check engine light is on the dash as the O2 sensors will either be missing or unable to read emissions. And looking under the vehicle, the exhaust system should run from the engine to the tailpipes. But if your catalytic converter has been stolen, there'll be an obviously missing section. So what vehicles in your fleet are most likely to be targeted by the catalytic converter thieves? Uh, certain models contain more precious metals in their converters like the Toyota Prius 2009 or older models, Ram 2500s and Ford F250s. Uh, the newer Prius models are also a target along with other hybrid electric vehicles as they use up less metal uh, while using electrical power. And vehicles with higher ground clearance are also targeted as they don't need to be jacked up and provide easier access uh, to the converter for these. So how can you prevent uh, thefts from occurring to your vehicles? So some best practices to prevent theft include ensuring that the agency parking <laughs> locations are fully secured and have lighting and security systems to deter thieves during off hours. Uh, parking the vehicles in a secure, well-lit place near the building entrance or other areas that pedestrian traffic is high whenever possible. Engraving your vehicle identification number to the converter, which can help make selling the pot harder and help alert you if your converter has been stolen. Next slide, please. And what to do if you experience a theft. So contact your local law enforcement to report the theft and file a police report. Within 24 hours, report the details of the theft to Fleet Responses Accident Management Program at 1-800-338-0619. Uh, the correct extension is 1-1 to confirm English and then navigate to the driver reporting a new accident uh, portion. Fleet Response will complete an electronic automobile loss notice based on the call details and OVM and the fleet manager will get an email copy of this and the driver is responsible for obtaining all the information uh, needed to complete this automobile loss notice. And once that loss notice has been obtained, fleet response will provide assistance and give direction regarding where to go to get the converter repaired. And so I'm going to end my section with a little poll just to see how widespread this problem has been for the state fleet. So have you experienced a theft from one of your vehicles during the pandemic? Recording. 
seventy percent. All right. Uh, what was that? It's not as widespread as. And I will be passing this over to Dave Sargent to speak to fuel card contract updates. And if everybody could please just remember to mute their mics, please, if you're not speaking. Okay, thanks, Steve. And good afternoon, everyone. Dave Sargent here. I'll be pretty brief. I just wanted to give an update on our new fuel card contract with WEX. We go to the next slide, please. So VEH 100 is expiring at the end of this month and it's being replaced by VEH 117 fuel cards. Uh, it should be a pretty seamless transition for pretty much everyone on this call. The same cards can be used. Uh, the key takeaway is that there is a different statewide contract reference to whatever extent that matters for you all. It is now VEH 117 as of June 1st and it'll just be fuel cards with WEX. Some of you may have remembered that we had a separate category featuring syntax systems in our fuel management category. Uh, that did not entice any interest over the last several years, so we are no longer offering that on the go forward statewide contract. So it'll just be limited to fuel cards with WEX. Uh, a part of this new agreement, though, we do have some enhanced incentives to hopefully help defray the cost of fuel prices, especially these days. So you may remember that we've had volume-based rebates in place uh, for many years now, but it was really based on a tiered system where you'd spend this much, you would get a rate of 1.2%. You know, if you go to the next tier, it'd be 1.3%, so on and so forth. And we pretty much plateaued around the activity that got us a 1.45% rebate. And so we were able to negotiate a flat rate of 1.5% going forward, which means that it's already more competitive than what we've had in place. And we get to maintain that same level of rebate as fuel activity goes down over the years from operating a more efficient fleet, uh, electrification, so on and so forth. We'll be able to continue taking advantage of that same rebate. Uh, so important to Remember that that is a rebate that is credited two months in arrears. So you won't see that until the invoice, uh, the month after uh, where the activity is being reported from. And that is based on statewide contract activity as a whole. So uh, in any case, whatever your volume is going forward, you should be getting a 1.5% credit on your invoice two months in arrears. Uh, separately, we do have prompt pay rebates, which is similar to what we've had in the past, but they are much more granular and ultimately more competitive than what we had before. Uh, again, some of you may remember that uh, it was a pretty fixed term. If you paid within six days, you got a credit of 0.08%. Uh, now they're incentivizing payments all the way up to payment made on the same day. Uh, which would be credited at a rate of 0.2%. And one day it's 0.19%, two days 0.18%, so on and so forth. So ultimately, there's between those two programs, there's a lot of upside for uh, annualized savings that we stand to benefit from. So on the volume-based rebate side, based on our current activity of fueling, we have an upside of about $15,000 annually across the whole statewide contract. So obviously that'll depend uh, your, the ability for you to take advantage of that or how much that, that impacts your monthly bill will depend obviously on your usage. Uh, but in total, we, we have a savings of $15,000 annually to look forward to. And even more so on the prompt pay rebate side, uh, upside of about $35,000 annually uh, if you were taking advantage, for example, of the most competitive rate previously, and you're able to take advantage of the most competitive rate going forward with same day payment. So uh, it's important to remember, especially on the prompt pay side, that these are rebates, again, credited two months in arrears. They are not discounts to be taken off the front end, off of invoices. So for those of you who work with Mars or interact with people who use Mars, it is not a prompt payment discount in Mars that you take on the front end. Again, it is a rebate that is paid on the back end.
but it is still advantageous to pay the invoice as soon as you possibly can to get the highest rate of rebate. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just touch on golf discounts. Uh, similar to the other programs, a little bit more granular here and ultimately more competitive than what we've had in place. It used to be just two cents per gallon. Uh, now you can get up to five cents per gallon when you exceed 10,000 gallons per month. Uh, I will say that you know, it's important to be smart and take this into context. Uh, I'm not sure about where you all are fueling, but right outside my house is a golf station that is about 15 cents more expensive than other gas stations down the road. So obviously a discount uh, only matters to the extent that it'll get you a better rate ultimately compared to a competitor. So that's it for me on the fuel card side. I'm gonna turn it over to Karen, who's gonna take you through some vehicle ordering and production issues. I'll just sort of preemptively echo her comments by saying that it continues to be really tough out there, uh, to, to put it mildly. The vehicle industry as a whole is experiencing continued challenges and it's only gotten more challenging, frankly, since the last time we met. In fact, since the last time we met, there's been an earthquake in Japan, there's been COVID lockdowns in Shanghai, there's been a war in Ukraine, uh, there has also been fallout from the border crossing issues uh, in Canada. So it continues to be really tough out there. And it's important that we control what we can control uh, because there's a lot that we can't, frankly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. We'll take you through some best practices, and making sure that to the extent that we're still in this bind, that we're doing everything we can to mitigate the impact. We'll, we'll get through it, but we still have a ways to go. And there's some things that we can do to help limit the damage. So with that, Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Rasnick, the lease administrator with OVM. And uh, before we get to like best practices, next steps, I'm going to just kind of touch base on some of the things we've talked about several times now. At this point, the uh, pandemic conditions continue to affect the supply chain. Um, we've got decreased production due to, you know, labor shortages, material shortages, um, just everything that's going on. Uh, the manufacturers are, are moving up build out dates where typically we could pretty well rely on the order banks being open for, you know, several months and we had plenty of time to place orders for new vehicles, we've seen order banks open for you know, a couple of weeks or so, and then they close uh, early, uh, earlier than expected. And some of these order banks are being closed you know, without notice. So we get a communication same day. Last week, I actually, on Monday, I received an email from a manufacturer that an order bank had closed the previous Friday. So it's happening more and more often that we're seeing these closures and shorter, um, time periods for order banks to be open. And it's just simply because they don't have the reliability to have their parts and to have their people to be able to do, produce these vehicles. Um, some orders have actually been canceled outright by the manufacturer because they know that they're not going to get enough of a certain part to create a certain spec of a vehicle. Um, so they must be reordered next model year. and. For some of those, we have to wait until August or September before that model year opens um, and then replace those orders with that manufacturer and, and hope that they're able to get inventory for parts and, and whatnot that they need to be able to produce them. So another thing we've encountered is that uh, certain manufacturers are limiting which vehicles they're making available to their commercial and government fleet customers. Um, a, a specific vehicle that we tend to order a lot of in our fleet, we actually were told by the dealers this year that the manufacturer is not allowing them to sell them to government fleets. They're doing retail only for that particular model. So um, it's all sorts of different things. The, the manufacturers have a lot to deal with uh, in trying to get these vehicles out there and they're managing their own um, issues and, and what they need to do to be able to stay stable and make money um, in different ways and it's affecting us in different ways. So but all of this, like Dave said, it's, it's challenging, but we can get through it. 
So speaking of making money, um, so pricing, we actually expect and have been told in different ways that the pricing for vehicles is going to be increasing. Normally you have maybe a 2% increase year over year uh, for an actual base vehicle price. Uh, we may see higher price increases this year to cover, you know, prior year production shortfalls and all that sort of stuff at each of the manufacturers. They just need to put a higher price on it to, to make their money back for what they're creating. Um, another thing we've been told by dealers, uh, there was a specific model that we were told they normally have a $7,000 concession for government customers. And this coming model year, they've been told by the manufacturer that's going to be reduced to 1000 so, and these are things that are kind of happening across manufacturers. So we expect all vehicles will most likely be much more expensive this coming year than they were in previous years. Uh, and that may continue for a couple of years as things kind of get more stable than they are now. So um, like we've always said, factory ordering is always recommended, even with all of these challenges, uh, it does get you the vehicle that you really want without any extras. Um, it gets you the best pricing that's available. Um, you do have to wait for it to be produced, so that's a downfall, but um, with everything the way it is now, every vehicle you're looking at is going to be a wait. Um, if you do happen to find something off lot, which that's very rare these days, uh, most things, even though dealers are getting more of an influx of vehicles into their lots, most of those vehicles are already accounted for in one way, shape, or form. So if you do happen to find something that's not already claimed, you can expect a much larger off-lot fee for those vehicles going forward as well, just because demand is still very high um, with production being so low. So, and the last thing on pricing and budgeting that I wanna remind people to do, like I said, we've said this before, just kind of reiterating and reconfirming these things are still issues. Um, you need to put in your budget some money for repairing your current vehicles because they're most likely gonna be in service longer to fulfill your business functions while you're waiting for those new vehicle orders to come in. So with all that said, um, kind of next steps, best practices, plan early. Um, it's getting harder to, to get these vehicles. Like we said, with you know, order cutoffs and, and everything, it's ever changing. So you may have to pivot to a different vehicle than you originally were looking to get. Um, you can expect delays upon delays upon delays, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we've had some, you know, it's the 16 to 18 weeks for delivery lead time. And then when it gets, you know, a few weeks out, the manufacturer says, okay, well, we, we don't have enough to produce this. We're gonna have to extend that another month. So we've seen a lot of times where the uh, weeks for delivery have been extended once you get closer to where it would be delivered. It's not happening all the time, but it is happening fairly often. So continue to expect those delays and you have to be prepared to expect to accept these new vehicles in the next fiscal year. Um, I know Cheryl, my counterpart on the owned vehicle side, the direct purchases from agencies, she actually was working with an agency recently who's planning to accept a vehicle in FY24 because it's just gonna take that long to produce the vehicle with everything that's going on right now. So. Um, what you need to do really is just work with us to understand availability and we'll help you reduce delays whenever that's possible. Um, there's only so much we can do, but we will do everything we can to make sure we get you the right vehicle as quickly as we can. Um, so with that, I'm going to just go through a little bit of what we've got um, as an established outline for the acquisition process. So this, because of all the things going on in the production industry, uh, we wanna remind you there's also a process with OVM, whether you're purchasing directly or you're going through the lease program, you still have to submit the workbook that identifies your need for the vehicle, um, provides your justification, what type of vehicle you're looking for, when you're looking to have it um, arrive and you know what you're turning in in exchange for that new vehicle. So. OVM still has to review it. We're going to also be examining your utilization data across your agency and uh, potentially across your secretary, depending on what the utilization is looking like for that uh, area. Um, we'll apply the Executive Order 594 and the fuel efficiency standard to what you're looking for as well. So there's a acquisition process where we're 
kind of a, a path where you want to look at a battery electric vehicle first, then a plug-in hybrid, then a hybrid, and then finally uh, internal combustion engine if none of those others are available that would meet your need. Um, we'll also be comparing those turn-ins that you provided to our replacement criteria reports. So if we find other vehicles that look as though they should be replaced sooner, we may be going back to you and saying, this one turn in doesn't really make sense. Let's turn in this older, more, you know, higher mileage vehicle than the one you put in. And it's quite possible we don't have eye, boots on the ground. We're not actually seeing these vehicles with our eyes. There may be a physical condition issue with that vehicle that you put as a turn in that may make more sense to have that remain as the turn in, but we'll have that dialogue back and forth just to understand the situation. Um, and one point that I wanted to make here as well is if we see through the utilization data review and the replacement criteria report um, that you've got potential for redeploying a vehicle instead of getting a new vehicle as you know, a part of your fleet, then we'll make that recommendation instead of buying a new vehicle, you need to take this other vehicle from one area and redeploy it to cover this function um, and still turn in that older vehicle, but you're not going to actually get a replacement for it. You're gonna take another vehicle that you're not really utilizing well and put it in the place for that vehicle. And once this is all agreed, if you are approved to get a new vehicle, then we get a quote from the vendor um, and the agency and the vendor and OVM all work together to do continued iterations of the workbook until they're agreed and finalized as well as the quote form so that that order can actually be placed. All right, so again, with all of that, <laughs> I'm going to just touch base on a new program that Vinny had mentioned at the beginning, where we would like to try to assist people in getting vehicles sooner, if at all possible. The Least Electric Vehicle Inventory Program, and we're calling it Levi just because you know the state, and we love our acronyms. So um, least, electric, least Electric Vehicle Inventory, the Levi Program, is an initiative for OSD to purchase and hold an inventory specifically of electric vehicles or for um, plug-in hybrids, if that's the most advanced technology available in that segment. So plug-in hybrids and battery electric, fully battery electric vehicles are considered ZEVs under Executive Order 594, and that is the thought process behind getting these vehicles specifically. So these vehicles will be specific specifically available to lease program customers only. They are not something we can then just turn around and let another agency outright purchase. They're gonna be through the lease program only. So they're gonna be held out at the OVM lot. You'll be able to, once they've arrived, you can go take a look at them, see if they work for your fleet and go through the process that I just iterated with the acquisition workbook and all of that stuff. So because they're gonna go out at the OVM lot, we're actually, OSD is gonna go through our own process to get charging stations put in. Um, so we're gonna have some firsthand knowledge of that process. And for those other agencies that are starting to look into EVs and the infrastructure that's involved, um, we'll be able to provide at least what we've gone through uh, once we've done this. So this will be done over the next several months. And you'll see here on the chart, I'm not gonna go through all the different vehicles, um, but these are the things that we're, we're looking at. You know, there's a e-transit cargo van, there's a pickup, there's some minivan options, uh, SUV options and sedan options that we're looking to put out into the OVM lot in the future so that those customers who can go through the lease program uh, and the vehicle fits their needs, they'll be able to get them right away if we do have them in stock out at OVM lot. All right, so I think that was all I had. So, except for this last question, which is a poll. So if we were, well, it is being put in place. So it's not an if it is in place, would you use it? Um, we're just curious what the interest is for getting these vehicles. Is it a metro? Yep, 54% just giving it another minute. Yep, great. It's 59. Interested to see what the results are. We seem to be stuck on 59%, so I will end it there. Okay. 60, oh, no, 65. 
is last second diapers. <laughs> yes. All right, I'm going to end it now. Okay, it looks like there is some interest. That's good to hear. Um, I also see that there's a, a large portion that say their fleet isn't ready for EVs yet. So like I said, um, OVM itself is going to be going through the infrastructure process in a very short period of time. So we'll be able to help you through that so that you can get better prepared for EVs. Uh, because Executive Order 594 does officially start in uh, FY23. So we need to look at that acquisition path now rather than later. All right, and I believe I'm handing it over to Eric, who's gonna to talk to you about the benefits of these electric vehicles. All right, thank you, Karen. I um, just wanna make sure you can hear me that I unmuted myself correctly. Yes. Excellent. All right, well, thanks, thanks everybody. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Um, before I jump in, I wanna just echo Vinny's uh, message to Chelsea Keene. Uh, for those of you who have worked with her in the past, you know how uh, helpful she was and also how talented and skilled she was at uh, providing uh, some great data for us and, and really uh, providing some great information about electric vehicles, charging stations, and, and really the whole process that we are going through. So she is her present to us leaving. She has left us with some great analysis and slides that I'm going to present here, and I'll be relatively quick. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. So we wanted to do, um, in today's world, I think we all know that there are um, new electric vehicles coming out every day uh, and also quite a lot of volatility in the gasoline market, as I'm sure all of you uh, see every day uh, to and from work and, and during your, your uh, job uh, every day. Um, and so I think what we wanted to do was just quickly remind folks a little bit about the Ford F150 F-150 Lightning vehicle, the newest electric vehicle from Ford that uh, just came out over the last couple of months. Um, remind folks about some of the, the features and then do a little bit of a kind of pretend analysis um, comparing the cost uh, upfront and ongoing cost of the F-150 um, EV compared to a gasoline vehicle, just to give you a sense of where we stand now and uh, what those uh, cost comparisons look like when gasoline prices kind of go up and down. So I'm not going to go over all of this. These slides will obviously be made available, um, but just wanted to remind folks here of a lot of the uh, great features associated with the new Lightning uh, EV uh, pickup truck. Um, of, of note, uh, I will uh, say that the, the base model price is actually quite reasonable on this vehicle, um, uh, four-wheel drive, and, and as you'll see in a moment, um, not really that much more expensive than the, the gasoline counterpart. And also some of the, the key things like the payload and the towing are very similar to the gasoline powered, powered vehicle. This vehicle also has a lot of cool features, which I think we've shown before, um, but uh, a frunk, which for those of you who may not know what that is, is a front trunk. Um, so kind of a cool feature there. Um, it's also got a number of outlets available for onboard power as, as you need it using the, using the battery. Um, and then the base model has a 230 mile range, but there's also a version that comes with an extender and that gets you up to 300 plus miles of range. Uh, so that's kind of what we're talking about with the lightning. And when we look at the price, uh, what we do here is take a look at the total cost of, of the lightning vehicle, compare it to a gasoline four wheel drive uh, F-150, um, compare the upfront cost, uh, look at the rebates, and then look at the ongoing uh, fuel costs and maintenance costs, and then that add them all up and you get total cost of ownership um, over eight years is just the calculation that, that we've done. Certainly can do this calculation for fewer or more years. And again, not gonna go into all of these numbers, but I think as you can see, the starting base price is just a few thousand dollars higher for the Lightning. And these are prices taken off uh, the state contract um, for both um, uh, for what's available and for the gas vehicle as well as for the electric uh, version. Um, and you can see that after the rebate that's available through the DEP mass EVIP program, which Haiti will talk about in a moment, the upfront cost is actually lower for the electric vehicle. Then add in some of the savings you get from lower fuel costs, lower maintenance costs, and um, you get a substantially lower total cost of ownership, uh, about $14,000 give or take um, over, the, over the course of the eight year period. 
I should note, and this is important for the next slide, um, but this is based on gas being 265 a gallon, which we haven't seen for a number of months, but certainly back last summer, that's more or less where it was. And so if we go to the next slide, um, that's what this is showing here, the comparison total cost of ownership. As gasoline prices climb, um, if you click again, you can see that the total cost of ownership um, and the price differential between the EV and the gasoline vehicle um, continues to grow. And so that as you get to 365 or 465 a gallon, you're talking uh, $20,000 or uh, you know, more than $25,000 difference over the life of the vehicle. So just wanted to share that, that information with you. Um, this total cost of ownership uh, condition where we see EVs actually being less expensive to own and operate over its life compared to a gasoline vehicle is actually pretty consistent across many of the vehicle categories and vehicle types that we have available on state contract. And this sort of calculation is something that we or um, our counterparts at OVM can, can do for you just to give you a sense of what the cost comparisons look like. And with that, I'm gonna do one more slide. Keep going here. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, announce that we are in the process of hopefully developing a new grant program that will try and address some of the challenges uh, that many of you perhaps have been facing when thinking about how to obtain um, funding from different various sources to install EV charging stations, which as we know is an important element and facet of developing an EV program, the transition to EVs obviously requires the ability to charge those vehicles. And so we are very well aware that moving quickly to deploy charging stations at our state facilities so that we are then ready to purchase and acquire electric vehicles as they become available is really important. And so this grant program that we are in the process of hopefully finalizing over the next month or two, we still need some approvals from some outside funding sources, um, would uh, streamline and kind of centralize a grant program into one place. So it would be through our office and would allow for the full cost of those charging stations dedicated to fleet charging um, to be covered uh, by this grant program. A lot more details to come. Um, just wanted to let folks know that this is something that we are working on. And I think that we would encourage all of you to start thinking very carefully about where good locations are for charging stations um, and start thinking about where you have vehicles, um, where you might be planning to transition those vehicles to electric uh, and start thinking about um, siting and identifying locations for charging stations, because that's going to be the first step in any program moving forward with EV charging stations. And I know that um, Vinny and, and his team at OVM have been thinking uh, uh, thinking carefully about this and have some really good data that can help to prioritize where charging stations can be located. Um, I saw, I don't know, whoever's, uh, Susan or Vinny, if there's a question in the chat about domicile vehicles, you want me to wait and take that later or, or take that now, I can, I'm happy to do uh, either one. I think that's something that we can take um, later on at the end of the session. Sounds good. Thank you. And I think that is it for me. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Haiti Janik from DEP. Take it away, Haiti. Thanks, Eric. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Haiti Janik. Um, I run um, DEP's Mass EVIP Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, as well as some other grant programs for reducing air pollution from the transportation sector. So I'm going to go over today um, our programs with you. Thank you. Um, so I framed this as um, the most relevant programs for this audience, um, and I'll go over those, and then I'll also remind you about some of our other programs uh, for interest or um, in, in, in case you have dealings with some of those areas as well. But the, the ones that are most relevant to the state fleet are going to be our workplace and fleet program. This uh, is an open and rolling program, so you could apply now. And for the workplace part of it is for employees to be able to drive their EVs to work and, and, and charge. And the fleet uh, part of it is for a uh, company organization, y'all, who have a, a fleet um, to get these charging stations installed. Um, 
Eric just mentioned that they're working on a program to provide charging for this for the state fleet. So um, obviously we're going to be working very closely together once that shakes out to figure out how these things interact or, or don't. Um, but we um, did just get an extra $3 million for that program. It is, it is open to, to anyone um, in the state. So uh, we, we will have, we have plenty of takers uh, for that if, if everyone else goes over to Eric's program for a little bit anyway. Um, and then our public access program is one that could come into play. Uh, you have to allow the general public to have access to the charging stations um, at least 12 hours a day. But we do know and think that it can work for a fleet if they were to have it be public for 12 hours and then for fleet charging the other 12. And with that program, um, eligible costs for government entities can get 100% covered, but, but you do have to have something that you're uh, willing and able to uh, allow the general public to access. Um, we This is a very popular program for us. Again, it's always anybody, it's open to anyone. So we recently just found 10 million more dollars to keep that going, um, the, the gangbusters as, as it is. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and then finally, our fleets program, I think many of you know about and possibly have participated in, and that's what's going to get you that $7,500 off of your uh, Ford Electric uh, F-150 Lightning. So um, I'm really excited to see that that truck when we get it in. Um, I'm going to come test drive it. Um, so yeah, and then um, I also want to let you guys know that we did have a competitive DC fast charging program. These are the charging stations that are much quicker. Um, you know, it's not going to be as fast as filling up with gas, but you will, with some of them, you'll be able to get to 80% of your battery capacity in half an hour ish. So it's not too bad. Um, and we think it's great, but comparing it to gas, um, if you can work half an hour into the schedule or if it's an emergency and you got to get just get some charge, these will work for you. And they're they're popping up everywhere. Um, so we did a we did a 13 million dollar solicitation. Uh, I didn't start out that big, but again, we had so much interest that we asked for more funding and got it. And so um, I'm going to show you a map of those in a minute um, so you can see where these things are getting put. So yeah, $13 million for that. And then we also do finally uh, have a um, program for multi-unit dwellings and educational campuses. Uh, got another million for that. It's probably our least popular program for some reason. I think uh, multi-unit dwellings are having trouble figuring out how to install these and maybe the demand's not there yet. But, but we, you know, we get a few a month and we expect that to keep going and probably pick up at some point. Next slide. <laughs> she jumps. Um, so uh, this is um, a map of in Magenta is our uh, the 150 locations, the grantees for that our DC fast charging program. And as you can see, you know they're, they're peppered all over the state, including the islands. And we were pretty excited to be able to fund them all. It's going to be great. And then I also put on there the orange dots, which are existing um, DC fast charging stations. So I don't know who owns them, but they are publicly available. Um, you can see that they're clustered around Greater Boston for sure, but then also you can start seeing some patterns along the highway corridors. And for your information, there's also a federal um, uh, plug of funding coming in. MassDOT is going to be managing that. And I believe they're getting $63 million for DC fast charging, mostly along highway corridors. If they build out the corridors sufficiently based on some metrics, they'll be able to also put, if they have extra money, they'll be able to put them elsewhere as well. But yeah, so, I mean, if this is, if the, if the magenta dots are $13 million, you know, another 63 million coming. So um, just wanna let everyone know that, yeah, we're, we're moving to EVs. Um, and I, I saw from that poll that the majority of, of you don't feel ready, but the, the charging is coming. Um, so I don't know. Uh, we got you, <laughs> I guess I want to say. Um, next slide, please. And then we do have other programs at DEP uh, for medium and heavy duty vehicle replacement. This is These are retirement programs. You have to scrap the existing vehicles. And in general, they also have to be older. For our Volkswagen open solicitation, that was a competitive program that we did a couple of years ago. Um, it's on the table to do another one. Um, but I, I don't have um, definitive news on that yet. If we do, their requirement through 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 the settlement was 2009 and older vehicles. So that's going to uh, stay. We, we can't do anything about that. Um, and then I'll you know um, you can get on 
our mailing list email, of course, to find out about when these programs open. Um, so I will let everyone know. I think I, maybe I'll even send an email once we even just get permission to do it so people can start getting ready for that. But we also do get money from uh, the federal EPA for a Diesel Emissions Reduction Act program. And we did an open solicitation for that recently. We do get annual funding for this. So we do hope to do this annually. It's not as much money and it doesn't cover as much of the replacement vehicles, but it is a little more flexible and it does allow you to replace um, slightly newer vehicles. And if you're going all electric, I believe they're now allowing you to replace anything. Um, if, if you want, if you can find a medium or heavy duty vehicle that, that will work work for you. So, um, so yeah, so uh, lots, of, lots of programs, lots of funding. If you have questions or if you don't remember all this, but you think there might be something, you'll, you'll have my email. Um, we're here to help. Just shoot me an email and I'll answer your questions. Um, and with that, I think we have a poll to go to. Um, that's awesome. Thanks, Haiti. Yeah, so we, we actually do. We have a poll that ties a, a bit into the first question that we, we started everything out with. And it's understanding the availability and benefits of EVs. We'd like to understand, would you be more apt to attend an in-person August session with us if we hosted an EV ride and drive? So uh, in a moment, you'll see a, a, a poll pop up. We just appreciate some of your feedback. Fifty percent, sixty. Getting a great number of responses here. This is awesome. Thank you. Seventy-three, seventy-five percent. All right. I will close it in two seconds. Seventy-eight percent. Awesome. So once again, thank you. We're gonna take all of this data into consideration when we decide how we're going to host our uh, third quarter OVM quarterly. So um, we'll move into, we actually made fantastic timing actually. So we'll move into the Q and A session here. And what we have on the next slide is uh, a small number of pre-submitted questions that were sent to OVM uh, with, the, uh, with the attendee list. So I guess the first question we can jump right in do we automatically begin the process of obtaining a new vehicle each and every time a vehicle in our fleet reaches 100,000 miles? And this is a fantastic question. And short answer is no. Um, you want to factor in more than just mileage. So um, what you can see here on the screen is OVM evaluates the vehicle replacement on a number of categories. So age being eight years or older, odometer 100,000 miles or higher. Uh, lifetime maintenance spend being a calculation of about 33% or a third of the initial acquisition cost of the vehicle. And then depreciation, which is depreciated to 80% of the initial acquisition cost of the vehicle. So those four criteria end up coming together into what we call our replacement category. Uh, so there, as a vehicle progresses through those categories, whether it's eight years, 100,000 miles, et cetera, it moves its way up the priority list for replacement. And so this is something that OVM tracks, we retain in FleetWave. We have the ability to share this with you. This is a great data set, and a great way of you taking this spreadsheet out to your vehicles and taking a look and combining that with the physical condition and making a decision of, of what should be replaced within your fleet. So any, anybody who's interested in understanding how their vehicles rank in the order of replacement criteria can reach out to myself or Karen Rasnick and we'd be happy to provide you with that information. Uh, second question, uh, another good one. Uh, why is OVM putting telematics in equipment and trailers uh, when those assets are not managed by OVM? Uh, simply put, OVM has been instructed by the Executive Office of Administration and Finance to install telematics tracking in all valuable assets, including light, medium, heavy duty vehicles and equipment. So some of this extends beyond our purview, uh, but because OVM manages a bulk of the executive branch, we were chosen to be the entity to spearhead this initiative uh, on behalf of ANF. So um, while we don't manage most trailers and, and some equipment and things of that nature, uh, we've been there 
to, to help install telematics or ANF in these vehicles and equipment. So if you have any additional questions on that, you're welcome to reach out to myself or John Martin. And we can move into the, the third and final pre-submitted question. And I'll do my best to answer this here. And Karen, if I miss anything, please feel free to jump in and let me know and John the same. But for FY23 budgeting purposes, do we have any range yet for both telematics fees and general OVM per vehicle fees so we can forecast as needed? Are we anticipating increases? So um, I have good news in, in, in multiple places, but I'll start first. The telematics fee for monthly services should remain static at the $15.95 per vehicle per month, which is a total of about $191.40 annually. Uh, OB OSD covers the cost of the devices and additional services charge, additional service charges may apply to issues encountered, which cannot be resolved via phone or tech support. So, um, you know, device tampering or um, accident, vehicle, you know, vehicle damage, et cetera, may, may constitute a, a technician from GPS Insight going out to take a look at the device, which could constitute a fee, but those are very few and far between. And the next piece is the annual OVM fee uh, will be issued in FY23 for uh, all budget variables and will be finalized at that point, excuse me. And we're anticipating the OVM fee to remain the same, if not go down by a small amount, but it's it's always recommended to, to calculate in a you know, a two to 10% buffer, at least at this point, until we can communicate the finalized OVM fee. Uh, and that, that concludes the pre-submitted questions. I believe Dan Nakamoto had submitted something in the chat regarding um, EV charging stations for domicile drivers at their home. Uh, at this point, no, there have been no conversations regard, regarding installing uh, electric vehicle charging stations at uh, residences. Uh, but that is definitely something that we would be interested in understanding the need for and um, and, and having in-depth conversations with you regarding it. So um, as you can see from the slide here, this is just a uh, this is just a, a breakdown of all the presenters from today uh, and all the individuals that have helped contribute to this presentation. So I think it'd be a, a fair time to to open the floor up to anybody who has any additional questions that may have arisen from the content in the presentation. So I'll open the chat. Susan, if anything comes through, please, by all means, let me know. So I have. Looks like Alan Simons met, raised his hand. I'm, I'm sorry, Karen. Say it again. Looks like Alan Simons raised his hand. Sure. Alan, if you want to you want to unmute and, and come on camera, I'd be happy to answer a question you had. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. I've got interested in the uh, charging station thing. Uh, which was never as interesting to me as the electric vehicles, but now that we're facing some um, resistance on acquiring vehicles because of the supply chain and also because the design and development hasn't reached to every end of the market yet, um, like I can't get F-250s that are fully electric yet, um, I'm thinking more about charging stations and I'm interested in the what anybody knows about um, the fast chargers as opposed to level twos, because I'm trying to conceive along with, you know, my exec team and the regional people at each of our locations, what are we really gonna need? Are we gonna need level two or are we gonna need a combination of level two and fast charging? If we've got maintenance trucks, I'm thinking they live at home, they don't go far afield, they would be fine with level twos. Maybe all the fast charging we would need would be available on the mass turnpike or something. I'm not sure. So it's like a thought experiment that I'm starting to dive into. Yeah. And I just appreciate any feedback that any of you have, Eric, Haiti, anybody, about what other executive departments are thinking along these lines. I know we all have different kinds of operations, but there must be some commonalities as well in terms of um, what kind of charging stations go in at your different locations, in part because I don't want to be stupid about this. I want to invest properly at the front end and not have to pay more over time because I, I had smarter um, insights, you know, two years, three years from now. Well, I'd welcome Haiti and Eric to hop in here. I think they're going to have a, a ton of insight in regard to that question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Vinny. I'll jump in and Haiti, feel free to supplement. Um, what uh, what I'm going to respond to. So 
I think it's a great question, Alan, and um, I'm glad you're you're raising it and, and thinking about it because uh, obviously I think thinking thinking ahead is really critical here and planning for the future really matters. Um, so I think I would start by saying that it is our guesstimate um, that for most use cases in state fleets that level two charging will be sufficient. Um, you can virtually any vehicle on the market now and even in the foreseeable future, a level two charger will get you at least 25 miles of charge per hour. Um, and so if you're charging that vehicle overnight, you're gonna get 12, 14 hours of, of charge. Um, and so that's more than enough to fully charge uh, the vehicle. Um, we would also suggest that, you know, it's unlikely that you'll be running those vehicles down to zero every day. Um, so if you're driving those vehicles 50, 100, even 150 miles a day, um, level two charging is, is more than sufficient, uh, assuming those vehicles can be parked for a number of hours. Having said that, there are potentially some use cases where a fast charger might be important or might be required. And that could be for vehicle emergency vehicles or vehicles that have to operate 24 seven at some point and you might need to, to top off in, in 20 minutes or half an hour or 15 minutes as charging gets faster um, so that you can keep operating the vehicle. Um, but I again, I think that's gonna depend a little bit on what sort of fleet you have and what sort of operations you have. I'll also add that in some cases, a level one charger or a, a plug could be sufficient for vehicles that are really just maintenance vehicles um, at a campus. If those vehicles are traveling, you know, 50, no more than 50 or 60 miles uh, in a day, then a level one charger overnight will bring that vehicle back up to, to full charge. Um, level one gets you about five miles per, per hour of, of charge. So there are definitely different solutions to different um, operation use cases, and we're happy to talk through that with you and you know join Vinny and his team and Haiti and others to to chat with you and give you some guidance. But that would be kind of my my overarching uh, guidance. And our grant program will focus primarily on level two charging as kind of the the primary and best use case. Although we recognize that you know level one charging might be um, might be useful for some use cases as well. Great, Eric. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Alan, H Haiti, Haiti, I'm just wondering if Haiti wanted to. I was going to ask if Haiti had anything to add. Sorry. Uh, I, yep, that, I think Eric covered it. I would also, I would also have emphasized that um, for some of you, you can just plug it in the wall. Um, so that, that's that's good to know. So people don't realize that you don't need special equipment um, for for. Um, just to get power back into it in, in some way. Um, but the thing that the, the main thing I would say is there is also, if, if say you need like a little bit faster of a speed than the highest level two, um, but you don't necessarily need a 150 kilowatt, which is fast, a DC fast charger, um, they do make, there are products out there that have like up to, I wanna say, um, 36 kilowatts when level two kind of tops off at 22 to 24. So there is a nut kind of an in-between and it is a DC fast charger, but it's, I actually call it the DC slow charger. And we did um, have an internal conversation and decide uh, procedurally that we will fund those through our Mass EVIT program, which is otherwise an exclusively level two charging um, program, uh, AC charging program. So if you come across that um, that charging station and you think that's gonna work best for you, it's, it also is not nearly as expensive as, as the higher kilowatt DC fast chargers. Um, uh, yeah, we, we probably will fund it. Always double check first, but yeah. Okay. Lots of yeah. options. The, the last thing I think I, could, I can contribute to this is we're going to be able to use the telematics data that's being collected through all of these vehicles to help identify the miles that a vehicle is being used on average daily, uh, how much time it sits at night, things of that nature that can then help decide whether or not you need a, a level one, level two, DC fast charger, et cetera. So there's, there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be available to you that's not going to leave you out and kind of fumbling around blind trying to make a decision for what, what best suits your fleet's needs. So, and and uh, Vinny, I, I, I do want to just add to this sure. conversation that 
there is a huge cost differential between a DC fast charger and a level two charger. And so I think anybody thinking about a DC fast charger really needs to take that into account, especially with all of the fast chargers that are being deployed through the DEP program and, and then over the next several years through the, the federal slash mass dot program. Um, you can get, you know, eight to 10 level two charging stations installed for the cost of one DC fast charger, you know, ballpark. Um, so there's, there is a question about sort of cost effectiveness and, you know, how we best use our, our, our funding. Absolutely. And all of it will be able to kind of prove through the data collected. So great, Alan, great question. Uh, Eric and Haiti, thank you so much for the, the, uh, the answers. Um, I saw Dan's hand pop up. So Dan, if you'd like to come uh, up. Question, I no noticed in the last couple of weeks, there's been a change in the frequency of uh, the issuance of the telematics reports, you know, and I, I, many of them are coming daily. Um, from my sort of vantage point at the executive office, I really am more interested in the monthly information. I, I just sure. want to make sure that we will still get like monthly uh, speeding re violations reports. Yes. Um, so we'll, you will definitely get your monthly report still. Um, we're, we are working on providing a number of, of fleet managers and, and CFOs, et cetera, some access to uh, a database that we have built that helps kind of take all of that information, break it down and be, make it more digestible. So more to come on that maybe in the next uh, couple of weeks to a month, Dan. But more than likely, I'll, I'll be reaching out to you and a number of the fleet managers within your secretariat to pilot some of this information and pilot this program and, and get the information out to these individuals in the, in the, the time fashion that they're looking for. Great. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Megan, I know you put a, a question in the chat here. It says, thanks for covering this. I feel like I've asked it before, but the visual is helpful. I keep moving. Okay, what else? Oh, I missed that. Okay. There was another question in here. No, okay. Susan, have you seen anything else come through? Am I missing anything? I have not seen anything, no. Okay. Is there anybody additional that has any questions, anything that they'd like to talk about? This is a fantastic group, as you can see, to, to, you know, to be able to you know, pick people's brains, identify how they're handling certain situations, pick up on best practices, et cetera. We have Plenty of time here, and, and if, if there's anything that you'd like to know, this is this is the forum for it. All right, I have Dan's hand. I don't know if Dan's hand was still up, and I have Molly. So, um, Molly, do you um, so we have a couple of electric vehicles. We're in the process of building our infrastructure for um, chargers. Um, I reached out to the WEX program, and they said that that. What I, I wasn't aware of that the, the gas card right now and the charging fob is separate. That we have to apply for the fob to charge its charging stations until WEX works out the program with the state to have it blended in with the card. We're new to this program and we're trying to initiate like some kind of infrastructure because we do have a couple of new electric vehicles. Um, is anyone else working with the two situations until the WEX program falls in place? So can I ask, are these, are these chargers also public facing? So the chargers um, are brand new and they're in new locations. But before we deploy our cars, we, we're trying to understand how to work with the, with the fob and the gas card. And, you know, I was not aware that this would be a thing until Wex made me aware of it. They will be public, but most of the time they will be uh, us, uh, on our premise yeah, with I our think that, yeah. chargers that are being installed right now. Sure. So I, I, that might be a, a, a bit of a unique situation. Uh, I know that there's going to be a number of programs and, and releases that are going to be just kind of fleet facing chargers that won't require fobs or wex charging or wex, wex cards etc it'll essentially be a commonwealth owned dedicated charging station that can they can plug into the vehicle and, and we can track through telematics um, the the charging of that asset 
Now it sounds like because the, this particular charging station is connected to data and also public facing that there needs to be some type of, of maybe payment or tracking form on it. Um, you know, that, that's a great question. I would have to investigate it on my end. I don't know if any of the team has information they could provide at the moment, but I definitely could take your question back and get a better understanding and, and reach back out. Yeah, because Wex was not sure that, you know, they, they said they still hadn't met with the state and they were in process of setting up um, a program. But, you know, I was not aware of this. And, and you know, we, we, before we deploy them, we have to, you know, be able to make sure that we can actually track it with our programs. And, um, it, like, I, I, I'm looking forward to a program that will give us a, a structure and how to have state um, charging stations and um, you know, a process of like tracking um, the charging for our vehicles because like I said, we're, we're, we're new to the game and yet um, there is no, no rules for us to follow, no program I, to help guide us along the way. So I'm hoping we get some kind of a manual or something that would, that would help us implement a new part of our fleet into like the electrical um, program. So your, your question spawned two fantastic members to maybe come in here and give you some, some insight. I think Eric was here first, followed by Dave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Molly, actually, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, can you explain to me um, uh, what it is you want to do in terms of tracking data when you're plugging in just for your vehicles, for the fleet? Forget about the public facing for the moment. What's the, well, what's your goal? Our our agency is, we don't own our buildings, we lease them. So we're going to have to install some, some uh, chargers, but we are also going to have to um, install, I think, separate meters. And um, there, there are, there's a problem with the, um, I don't know, I just like with the, with the national grid and all the, um, the, the infrastructure for like, like the, the, like with, um the private entities like for installing like state programs and they're all going to have different um different programs to you know to help us install an incentive so like right. we're, we're we just got new cars we're we're, we're in the process of like in, installing you know some some um chargers and then we're finding out that some charges are better than others and we just don't have anything to go by basically. So we're, we're looking for like a structured, not a manual, but something that would help us like guide us along the way. Okay, this is where we're going to be, you know? Yeah. yeah, I think that the installation at least facilities is a complicated one. And so I, it, it sounds like that's what's kind of raising the, the complexities here and the challenges for you. You know, I think what we would say is that if, if it's an owned facility, as a, as a state agency, you can sort of make the choice as to whether or not um, you want the, the station to have sort of data capabil capabilities and to be tracking um, usage, or you can go for a sort of simpler model where you can just plug it in and you're, you're paying for that electricity as part of your facility operations and you don't necessarily need to track at a granular, granular level from the station anyway, what, you know, what's happening. Um, and that that can be done potentially in the future through some sort of telematics, hopefully, um, process. For lease facilities, what it sounds like you're saying is that you're you're installing the stations, but the but if you're putting in your own meter, then you don't you're not paying you're not paying for the power. You're already pay, paying for the power through the bill. Like I'm not I'm not I'm not understanding why you need to actually pay for the electricity that you're using at the station if it's your station and it's your meter well because we're a lease we have lease properties throughout the state yeah. and um because there are many um entities like for power national grid you have bell you have you know different towns have their own power and like we go from one end of the state to the other and like we're trying to build our infrastructure and yeah. yet there's there is no, there is no, like basic like plan to say okay, you know, 
to, to say, okay, a belt gives you this kind of discount or like, um, or, or like how, how you can have a state agency um, keep, you know, when we're installing, like say we have to install five um, meters, uh, charging stations, we'd have to have five meters, but we wouldn't get the grants from my understanding on this. I'm just really confused that we wouldn't get the grants because they wouldn't be public um, chargers. Like, so like the, there's a lot of like information out there, but I just need a structured like program that helps us right. ease into this, in, into this new era of vehicles. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe we take this conversation, Eric, maybe this yeah. is something that, that I get Molly's information on and maybe the, the group here, Green Fleet Committee, you know, some members from OVM can reach out maybe find a way to assist i think there are some there are multiple levels of complications here which there are yes yeah i don't know if there's anything that, that maybe dave would want to add but I, I think this is maybe so granular it's something that we we could potentially take offline and help solve for her for molly that would be wonderful i'll just jump in with a really quick part of this it's obviously not going to address the overall concern but this Part of the way this conversation started out was with wax cards how that links to charging stations yes yeah. yeah so so just to clarify wex shouldn't be waiting on anything from us at the state level they have a partnership with charge point right now who is basically the has the lion's share of volume right now and right. that program enables users to get a charge point fob, you are correct, that you would need to apply for that separately. And if you have that, which you would need to authorize most charge point stations, you could link the WEX card as a form of payment. WEX is working with other manufacturers to accomplish the same thing so that ultimately the WEX card or, or a fob may wind up replacing the card it is basically more and more universal and can be used at different kinds of stations. ChargePoint is the first manufacturer they partnered with and they're on to others. So I think that's part of what's going on in, in context to your question, but obviously there's a lot more that you're looking to explore just for an overall program, but that piece at least addresses the WEX component of it, I think. Yeah, and, and if, like, if it's only a ChargePoint fob, um, one of our other regions may not have a charge point charger so that was my confusion if, if we have a you know an employee going from one end of the state to the other in a, in a state vehicle like how is that all going to connect like I just I just feel like we're just not quite there yet you know yeah it is an ongoing process for it, it's not unlike fuel cards 20 30 years ago where there wasn't yeah. a universal one and every station had its own card mm -hmm. and it, it's it's a process to basically onboard those different manufacturers. Right. And I know they're working through it. I mean, I, I would just say that, you know, to the extent that you're aware of other types of stations that you'd be interested in using with a WEX card, mm -hmm. uh, you could certainly give me that feedback and you could certainly give whoever you're talking to at WEX that feedback. We've been in conversations okay. with them for a couple of years now, stressing the importance of rolling this out. And, and they understand, I mean, that's the way the industry is going. So it behooves everyone to, get on board with this. But I think the more feedback about specific manufacturers, uh, the better. Because I think they're, you know, charge points really the biggest one. And then you got a long tail of sort of secondary and tertiary providers after that, which isn't to say that charge points any better. It's right. just that they've been, you know, they've been in the space a little bit longer and I think people are more familiar with them. Right. I just didn't know if any other agencies were having this struggle. Not, not at the moment. There are, there are some, there are some complications, uh, but nothing, nothing that's that seems to be as complicated as maybe what you're experiencing right now. So I, I am gonna, I have some of your contact information written down here, and the team will reach out and we'll see if there's a way that we can help your agency uh, solve some of them. Oh, great! That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Okay. Is there anybody else? Well, I'll maybe give it another 30 seconds in case anybody thinks of anything. Is there anything that you'd want to discuss? We can pop it in the chat. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, 
I'd like to thank everybody. I think this was a, a wildly productive um, OVM quarterly. There are, there's a lot of learning that's going around, a lot of individuals that are on the cutting edge of, of electrification and decarbonization and things of that nature. So I appreciate you all sharing your insights, sharing your questions, things of that nature. Um, our contact information and some of our, our, our info is up here on this, this particular slide. Uh, the recording will be available along with a copy of today's presentation. I know that that was a question that was asked by Emma in the chat. So we will definitely make sure that we get you a copy of today's presentation. Um, thank you to everyone. And one, and one last time, I just ask those that are potentially interested in the electric vehicle lease inventory that we are acquiring to reach out to myself or Karen Rasnick for some more information. Uh, any, any questions or help that you need with, uh, with the charging stations, we're here along with our partners at uh, uh, DOER and DEP. Uh, and we would all like to just thank you uh, for your time this afternoon. So with that being said, I hope you all have a nice afternoon and we look forward to seeing you at the next quarterly session. Thanks. Vinny. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.